Hello and welcome back to World That Age 12. And this week I'm joined by Philip Mansell. That's written this book that I'm holding up right here on Louis XIV, King of the World, or better known as the Sun King. And let's begin with how this Bourbon history, what was so intriguing about Bourbon history to you, you and what is about Louis XIII, for sorry, no, not Louis XV, but Louis XIV. That's, you think, of course, Versailles, as which will be a big part of this episode. But what do you think captured most people's imagination when it comes to Louis XIV? Well, the Bourbons came to the throne in 1589 with his grandfather, Henri IV, who was assassinated. So it was always a contested monarchy with the problems of France, of European wars, of bad finance. But they thought they were the greatest kings in Europe, the most holy and revered, crowned with holy oil bought, brought from heaven. And they were completely fascinated by Europe as well as France. I think that is my main discovery about Louis XIV. He thought of Europe as well as France, all his reign. So let's begin with the, a little bit background on how the Bourbons came to power, because I mentioned it was Henry IV, oh, the, who was the first Bourbon. So let's begin a little bit about the history of how the Bourbons came to power. The Bourbons were cousins of Henri III. They came to power by the legitimate succession, descendants of St. Louis. They were opposed by Catholics and the city of Paris, but eventually they conquered them. They were legitimate hereditary kings of France. Henri IV, who was murdered in 1610, then Louis XIV's father, Louis XIII, who faced endless conspiracies and civil wars. He died in 1643. And Louis XIV came to the throne at the age of five. He had been a late birth after his parents had been married for 20 years. And he was called the child of the miracle given by God. Mm. So, again, it's uh, so I want to get this right at the way because, as I mentioned as well in the beginning of the book, it's uh, Louis XIV saying, Never cessez as moi or the state is me. So, where do, again, where does this kind of uh, here, where does it come from, the cessez as moi? Because, it, like you said, it never supposedly said those words. So, where does the idea that it said it come from? I think it's a fantasy by revolutionary historians. He was extremely proud of his birth and his royal rank, but he was also an extremely industrious bureaucrat, waking, working until midnight. And what he actually said is that the king is the first servant of the state. And he also said, as he was dying, I am dying, but the state remains. He had a very strong feeling of the administration, the army, and the state power of France. And he would spread French institutions as well as royal authority. So let's begin, of course, with, I want to begin with, before we go into the Louis XIV's birth and upbringing, I want to begin with the marriage of Anne of Austria, or she was Spanish, but as you mentioned, it was she was called Anne of Austria because she was an Austrian origin, so kind of. But let's begin with the marriage between Anne of Austria and Louis XIII, because he dies quite early in Louis XIV's birth. So I think it's important as well to understand the marriage and how the regency of Anne of Austria was between under Louis XIV's upbringing as well. Anne of Austria came from the Habsburgs, who were reigning in Spain as well as Austria. She was an infanta of Spain from the enemies of France, but there was a brief uh, treaty and it was meant to bring in peace in Europe. In fact, it did not. In fact, she corresponded treasonably with her brother, the King of Spain, when France was fighting Spain. But she was quite a good regent for Louis XIV from 1643, his accession, until 1651, when he reached the age of 13. And she maintained the power of the French monarchy to a certain extent with the advice of her chief minister and possibly her lover, Cardinal Mazarin. Let's talk about the relationship between Mazarin, Mazarin or, and 
and also because as well Mazarin will be an important figure at this early part of Louis XIV's life as well. Ma Mazarin was, they had a, he had a secret code for corresponding with, with Anne of Austria. There are many expressions of love. Certainly there was a private passage from her apartment to his apartment in the Palais Royal. I should think something happened, but who knows? I think he was all obsessed with power and money. He was a, quite a good diplomat. He made sure that France was allied by the end to almost every power in Europe except Austria. But he liked prolonging wars because he benefited financially from wars. And he was hated by the French for his corruption. So one reason why there were such long rebellions in Louis XIV's early reign was hatred of the corruption and the absolutism of Mazarin and of his Italian origins. Crowds would go through Paris shouting, Point de Mazarin, Point de Mazarin, no Mazarin. He had the largest fortune in France of anybody before the revolution. So let's talk about Louis XIV's upbringing. Was it a happy upbringing? Or how, how did it was like you said, it was five years old when when he was meeting King because his father, like we thought said earlier, his father died quite early in this reign. So he how had, he had a, he how had was a, his upbringing? A, yeah, Louis the Fourteenth had a conventional upbringing, very Catholic, a lot of Christianity, daily services, a lot of classical history and French history. A lot of body exercises. He was extremely fit as a young man. It's completely appropriate that the Olympics, some of them are being held in Versailles this summer, 2024, because Louis XIV was an Olympic level rider and dancer and swimmer and pistol gun shooter. But it was also a troubled upbringing because there were frequent rebellions at one time, he had to leave Paris in secret by night with his, his mother and the court. But he was also quite emotionally secure because he was much closer to his mother than most boys of the age. And he loved Mazarin very much. He was his godfather. They saw each other constantly for political meetings. And he had a younger brother whom he loved also. So it was a real family life. And later... Mazarin's nieces were added to the family circle. Ex extremely attractive, unconventional young Italian women, some of whom were really quite well educated. Now, let's talk about his nieces because he, I don't, I'm different, even I don't remember her name, but he does fall in love. And I wouldn't say affair, but he has a kind of a love affair with one of his nieces as well that he almost, I believe, end up marrying, but of course it doesn't happen. Because yeah, you it, you cut out that. About late. Sorry, yeah. Uh, so let's talk about his nieces, Masara's nieces, because he does have yeah. a love affair with one of them, and but he almost end up marrying with one of them as well, but he, of course, end up as well as his father and marrying one of the Spanish infantas, which we will talk about later, of course, but let's talk about the love affair with Masara's niece. There were two nieces to whom he was very close, Olympe Mancini, who married a cousin called the Comte de Soissons, and who was a, a social leader at court, very clever, very quick. And the, the fact they were slightly outsiders would have probably have made them more attractive. And then there was her, her younger sister, Marie Mancini, with whom the king was passionately in love in 1659 and 1660, and even 1661. Unfortunately, the letters do not survive. They would have been sensational if they did, because they would have certainly made fun of Cardinal Mazarin and revealed a lot. It was truly his first and perhaps most passionate love affair. She was well-educated, challenging, unconventional, and very beautiful and alluring. And he sent her a dog with a collar inscribed with the words, I belong to Marie Mancini meaning he, the King of France, belonged to her. And Mazarin was horrified because it would have been a terrible marriage for the King of France, and he ended their close relations. And he, he sighed as a lover, but he obeyed as a king. Mm. 
So let's talk about the, the as you mentioned the, the marriage to the Spanish infant because it's the, again that is not common in European royal affairs. They, they were families, both families. Well, first cousin, I believe, and as well, they had this family relations to his mother. So it's a com- quite complicated family ties that he marries the Spanish infanta as well. So let's talk a little bit about marriage with the Spanish infanta. The Infanta Maria Teresa was very well born, but not not healthy, because no royal family intermarried more than the Spanish Habsburgs. And in fact, she was Louis XIV's double first cousin. But and they only had one healthy child, the Dauphin, whereas he had lots of healthy children by his mistresses. So that's proof of the the appalling biological consequences of royal marriages and royal inbreeding. And it's also an interesting marriage because it shows the conflict between dynasty and nation. Many French people wanted to expand French territory into the Spanish Netherlands, what's now Belgium, the most strategic, most fought over area of Europe. But instead, he married an infanta, himself with fewer acquisitions and in the end through that marriage inherited a claim to the Spanish throne and put his second grandson Philippe Duc d'Anjou on the throne of Spain as Philip V. Instead of expanding France he aggrandized his own dynasty. Any monarch of the time would have done the same but it was criticized sized in France. It almost destroyed the French throne because they started losing battles in 1708 and 1709. But and the key thing is the present king of Spain is a descendant of Louis XIV. And that would have made Louis XIV extremely proud. Because of that, there are still Bourbons on a royal throne in Europe. So, so let's talk about, of course, as he comes of age, and Mazarin is still his minister. But so let's talk a little bit about the relationship as he comes of age and take over the throne, as uh, not as a regency, but as a monarch. And let's talk about Mazarin and, uh, and his relationship until Mazarin's death, because Mazarin's death will change Louis' reign, I think, for the rest of his life. Mazarin was completely corrupt. Everything was for sale. Fr- France was in a state of general calamity economically when Mazarin died. He had made a huge fortune, but he had kept the monarchy going during the wars of the Fronde. But Louis XIV wanted to run the state himself. He'd been told to by Mazarin, in fact. And the state became more orderly, more rules, more administration, But in the end, the same old problems began. He said he would reform the finances. By the end of his reign, the finances were even worse than when he had inherited because of all his wars. And there was a huge debt in 1715. And other countries like England had begun to economically overtake France. Hmm. So let's talk about, of course, because there is another... And then the charm saying it's for the Fourquet, of course, wanted to take over as minister as uh, as after Masara, but of course Louis decided that no minister will be taken and he wouldn't listen to anyone. But and is this where the idea that it's just as moi come from that he because he took absolute power after Masara Masara's death and of course out of Austria, there was not involved either in the kind of Louis the decision no. after Masara's death. So let's go is this where the idea that you know, says a small come from? And of course, the thought about Fortier and Fortier and Maserat's, oh, sorry, not Maserat, but Louis XIV's relationship after he take absolute power. Well, Fouquet had a finger in every pie. He's trying to run the finances and also to run French overseas trade and to take over French diplomacy. Any young king would have got rid of him. What's interesting is the cruelty with which he was treated, being put in solitary confinement for 10 years, deprived of family visits. And Louis XIV had known Fouquet's wife. And Fouquet had been loyal during the Fronde. 
So in my opinion, there was some personal cause for that, possibly to do with one of Louis XIV's girlfriends, Louise de la Valliere. Um, but nothing is known. Hmm. And that, so let's talk about Fouquet's downfall because he thus tried tried to get a hand in government, as we've talked talk about. He wanted to become minister after Mazarin, but that doesn't happen. So how how does Fouquet fall from grace, to, so to speak? Yeah. Fouquet was suddenly arrested, and Louis the Fourteenth only used it trusted musketeers to arrest him, not royal bodyguards, showing that Fouquet had clients all over the court, including women. And then there's a grand trial in Paris. And what's interesting is that a lot of Parisians supported Fouquet. He was quite popular, or they just didn't like royal absolutism. So it's a case of the fallen minister being more popular even to a certain extent than the king. The king was criticized for the cruelty of Fouquet's, the verdict on Fouquet. So, of course, how does he decide that? Is it, is it because he does have a, like, a great power, doesn't he, that where Louis XIV is in, yes. invited? And so let's talk a little bit about his powers. Yes. If, if your introductions could be, because we don't have much time, maybe yeah. your introductions which could be a bit shorter. Uh, Fouquet yeah. had a grand palace, which you can visit now, called Volovicant, magnificent, um, made by the same team who would make Versailles, Le Vau, Le Nôtre, and Le Brun. And he gave several parties there for Louis XIV. And Louis XIV was overwhelmed by the splendor of the decoration, the tapestries and the fireworks at night. But he had already decided to have Fouquet arrested before the party. It, it is an absolutely magnificent interior. Mm. I recommend course, anybody to visit it. Mm. And of course, let's talk about the elephant in the room, and that's, of course, Versailles. And I want to, before we go into the building of Versailles, I want to talk about what was Versailles like before the others? What, and how was the surroundings? And why did he choose Versailles? as a location for the famous, his famous palace. Well, Louis XIV, is a, he's a man, he's a king and a country. He's, he's king of France. He represents France as well as himself. And in my opinion, he's making Versailles, of course, as a power statement, but also as a European statement to attract foreigners, to show to foreigners that France can now make a palace as good as any in modern Rome or ancient Rome. It's to compete with the Roman empires, full of busts of Roman emperors. And it's also in its position because he liked it. He'd had a love affair there with Louise de la Valliere and it had been built by his father. And he wanted to show his mastery over nature. So he builds it in a difficult position to show he could bring water up a hill and so on. And it's a palace for parties. There are endless receptions, plays, concerts, operas in Versailles. That's what makes it different from other European palaces. And also it's a show place for French luxuries, mirrors, furniture, the clothes of the courtiers. It's still used for commercial displays today um, by private companies. It's And it was maybe also quite efficient as an instrument of government because most of the main ministers had apartments there. You could see everybody quite quickly in a day in one building or building with wings attached. And there's no temptations like Paris or distances like Paris. Everybody was concentrated together. Let's talk about the outside of Versailles because it's also as fast was open to the public as well. And it's just was it unique for mon palaces in Europe and royal palaces in Europe at the time? What's what's it wasn't unique in style. There were classical palaces in France and and Italy, Rome, the, the pity in Florence. What's unique is the size, the special wings um that are one 
for the princes of the royal family, one for the courtiers. Everybody's together at Versailles. It's one of the largest. And the, they've all the princes have apartments in the uh, palace. Is there any secret corridors? And if it's it possible yeah. to find them today, if you go visit Versailles, it, how can you, can you find them go through the, some of these secret corridors? I think you need a whole lifetime to understand Versailles. There are secret corridors between the king and queen's bedroom put in by Louis the Sixteenth, for example, and corridors between Madame du Barry's apartment and Louis the Fifteenth's apartment. Yes, there were corridors. We still don't know everything about how Versailles functioned, particularly how the ministers saw the king. It, it was a working palace, an administrative and military headquarters, as well as a royal residence. Mm -hmm. And also and secret passages by which, through the, the royal family's wing, Count Fersen could visit Marie Antoinette without being seen by the public. Mm -hmm. So, of course, like, not everyone was a fan of uh, the palace. And one of them, of course, that thought about was Cardinal Colbert. So let's talk a little bit. Who was he, and he, why, why didn't was he not a fan of moving the capital, so to speak, to and got the seat of government to Versailles? Colbert was the chief minister of Louis the Fourteenth from sixteen sixty one to sixteen eighty three when he died, and he was a very remarkable administrator, full of ideas for the future, for expanding French trade, to make the Louvre the greatest palace in the universe, the main palace in Paris, that is. And he thought Versailles was unworthy of Louis XIV, a waste of time and money. He's criticizing it quite boldly to the king. And But because he was efficient, he was put in charge of Versailles when it's expanding. And the king would complain, oh, it's not being done quickly enough. Why isn't my bedroom ready? And the king would go into every detail himself. And maybe these criticisms killed Colbert because he couldn't bear not to please the king. And he, di he died in 1683, just after Versailles had been finished. And he's really a remarkable man who did think of the poor, who did try and protect the rights of peasants against nobles, who always thought of French trade and French industry and uh, how France could catch up economically with the Netherlands and with England. And mm. um, I want to talk, speaking of finances, what, what, how much did in finance that did go to build Versailles? What, what was the financial state like after the building? How, were they, how close to bankruptcy were they after building? Because it's quite an expensive, again, of course, the whole of mirrors and everything that the, the, the gardens and Everything in Versailles, of course, costs quite a lot of money. So what were the financial state like of France after the building of Versailles? Yes, Versailles was expensive, and Colbert complains about it all the time. But it's not actually as expensive as Louis XIV's wars or the 150 forts he built around France to protect it, which you can still visit today, are absolutely magnificent military structures in the Alps, or the Pyrenees, or the frontier with Belgium. Versailles cost about 100 million livres, but it was over many years. What, what is expensive is trying to build canals and fountains, bringing water to Versailles. And that was using French soldiers, some of whom died from overwork and from ill health, dealing with unhealthy water. But... It was always thought to be a way of bringing money to France, of attracting rich foreigners, poor foreigners, the attention of Europe. And there, I think it was quite successful and still is successful. It's the most visited palace in the world after the summer palace, the, the forbidden city in Beijing. Mm. And of course, you mentioned the wars and what and the, the, of course, one of the wars that we'll talk about is about the wars with the Netherlands. So what were French interest in the Netherlands and how did the, because it's, let's, it's, let's talk about a little bit about the wars that occurred in the Netherlands. The Netherlands. There again, it shows that Louis XIV was quite capable 
capable of making mistakes in foreign policy. The Netherlands had long been a French ally. It helped create the Netherlands in its war against Spain. But Louis XIV is jealous of it economically. There are various rows about medals and these things really mattered to Louis XIV. He was vain. Uh, the Dutch States General made medals which he took offence at and he launches an unprovoked war in 1672, which really goes on till 1713. The Netherlands is at the heart of European alliances against France. And it's really for economics, it's for very little proper motive. And he didn't even run it successfully. He didn't seize Amsterdam when a more daring general might have been able to. So, of course, and he have, I want to talk a little bit about, before we go into the Stuart exile, I want to talk about the term the Sun King. So when does the term the Sun King on Louis XIV occur and how, how does it become known as the Sun King? Is it because of Versailles itself? In fact, the term the Sun King comes later in the 18th or 19th century. At the time, he was compared to Apollo, who is the Sun God. And he takes Apollo as his symbol and the, the sun with rays going out. And he dresses up as Apollo at a great tournament in 1662, the Carousel. And it's all over Versailles. He's represented as Apollo or indeed Jupiter with thunderbolts or Hercules or Mars, the god of war. He wants to be Apollo because also Apollo is patron of the arts. And this is the most sympathetic side of Louis XIV. He loved the arts and treated some artists almost as equals. So he's the sun king. His, his rays are illuminating the universe. Mm. That is also the significance of it. And he's equal to many other gods and planets. Did this just in the beginning of the book, if he's worthy of being called the Sun King, what do you think? Is it worthy of the name to be called the Sun King? I think art artistically, yes. Politically and diplomatically, militarily, no. Because in some ways, he leaves France, he leaves France larger, which Napoleon did not do, but he um, weakens it economically. But artistically, his relations with Molière, the playwright, Lebrun, the painter, Le Nôtre, the great gardener who made the park at Versailles, with Lully, the musical composer, with dancers, with craftsmen, with furniture makers, with uh, people who make tapestry, is something quite exceptional. He's interested in every detail of decoration, and he visits the main royal factory, the Gobelins, several times. So he's a real artistic king, maybe one of the greatest of all royal patrons in the history of Europe. And of course, another thing I want to talk about is because the stewards were on the throne, and we talked about Charles I a while ago, and he was overthrown by Cromwell, who started with. Cromwellian Republic and the wish had a, would have an alliance with France. But again, it's the Stuart were also allowed to have exile in France. So let's talk a little bit about the Stuart exile in France, because that is super fascinating to me. And the Stuart dynasty in itself is, is super fascinating. So let's talk, talk a little well, bit about the Stuart exile in France. The relations with the Stuarts were very close. Henrietta Maria, Louis XIV's aunt, had married Charles I of England. She lives in France in exile. She's born a French princess. And so his first cousins, Charles II and James II, grew up in France in exile. Louis XIV knew them quite well. But strangely, Mazarin didn't like the Stuarts, and he had a close alliance with Cromwell, with a regicide. The French court wore mourning for Cromwell. And in the 1660s, gradually, Charles II of England and Louis XIV of France become allies. Uh, Charles II's sister had married Louis XIV's brother, another first cousin marriage. 
And so they had many intermediaries. A lot of English people then spoke French. And so it's a natural refuge for James II when he's overthrown by the Stadtholder of the Netherlands, William III, who's also his nephew, 1688, he flees. He hesitates at one time, but he flees to France. He's very well received by Louis XIV, and he's put in the palace of Saint-Germain to the west of Paris, which had been Louis XIV's main country palace before Versailles. And he's given a huge pension. And above all, he goes to court the whole time. There are mutual visits, maybe a 500 to James II and his widow before Louis XIV's death. And why is this? Well, there's two reasons. They want to divide and upset England, which has accepted the Protestant king, William III, and later George I. So he is a French tool used to invade Ireland or have conspiracies in England. But secondly, I think they liked Kings like kings. He liked being with another king whom he could treat as an equal and whom he regarded as a martyr for his Catholic faith. And he regarded the son of James II, called the Old Pretender in England, like uh, his own son and is even closer to him than to James II. It's, it's a bonding of two royal families, these visits. They're always at Versailles or, or Marly. Now, another thing that happens under Louis XIV's reign is, of course, the persecution of the Huguenot sects in France. And, of course, many turn into exile or forcibly convert to Catholicism. So, but it doesn't, or the exiles didn't always have positive consequences. So let's discuss the consequence of the Huguenot persecution and, of course, how it would affect France in the long run. Yes, I think it was one of his most terrible mistakes. First of all, it shows the brutality in his character because the Huguenots were tortured, arrested, massacred in some cases, um, deprived of their families, really treated like minorities in the 20th century, almost as bad. But he didn't go as far as one minister wanted, using these very words to exterminate them all. He didn't do that, but he tortured them mentally and religiously, forcing sometimes French soldiers, forced dying people to take the mass to, so they could die Catholic. And it's an ideological decision. We don't really know everything about it. He's probably trying to compete with the Holy Roman Emperor to be the best Catholic monarch in Europe. And it's commercially catastrophic because the Huguenots go with the technical and financial capital, the money, the scientific skills, the skills of making furniture or watches or guns, which had made them very much prized, even by Louis XIV himself at the beginning of the reign. He used a Huguenot miniature painter, for example. Um, and where do they go? They go to three countries hostile to France, England, the Netherlands, and Brandenburg, Prussia. And they really make Prussia as a great power, almost. There are many Huguenots in the Prussian army and the Prussian economy. They make Amsterdam a, a huge cultural center where Huguenots are printing books attacking Louis XIV and France very effectively. And they help make London the biggest commercial city in Europe. And it is then that London becomes larger in population than Paris. And there are Huguenot bankers and dressmakers and journalists and writers. And really, they kickstart the London and Berlin economies. And of course, as well, I think you were mentioned that this is the first time the term refuge or refugee began to be used yes. by the Huguenot persecution. Yes, that's correct. They, they use the word refugee and the refuge is where they take refuge in the Netherlands and England, especially. And it is, it's not true, but it's a, a story that the goal is said to have said, if Louis XIV had not revoked the Edict of Nantes, 
the first man on the moon would have spoken French. Hmm. And of course, another thing that is with Louis, of course, is that he wanted Nicholas colonialism began to take off in the 17th century. So, let's, so of course, let's discuss Louis' plan for a global colonial empire as well. Yes. He, he was very jealous of the English and Dutch colonial empires. He knew that overseas trade meant money and prosperity. And so he started colonies in West Africa, in India, in um, uh, in the Caribbean, though some French colonies already existed. They weren't really very successful, except for one, which is in the west of Santo Domingo, now called Haiti, which starts making very good sugar and coffee. And of course, he uses slave labor. The French slave trade starts then, and it is judged completely coldly there's a terrible phrase by a French ambassador about it he says this trade is extremely advantageous that's all he says about it the economic opportunities one reason why they wanted to control Spain was to grab the slave trade with the Spanish colonies because it was so profitable and it's then that Bordeaux and Nantes become huge ports partly on the the slave trade and also then that France begins trade with China which is more interesting and more adventurous before England um he's really the Bourbons have been underestimated as businessmen he meets businessmen he asks what he can do for them he's really interested in business and state finances and um of course, uh, before we go on to the war of Spanish succession, I want to talk a little bit about his relation with Maria Th- Marie Therese, as she's called by now, because she's changed the more French name. But let's talk about the children they have together, because quite a lot of them dies, and there's yes. only a few left by the end of his reign. So there's always a worry about succession for the French throne as well, as we will, of course, come in a second about the Spanish succession. But of course, before he is uh, quite worried, it seems, by so who is going to succeed him to the French throne. Of course, we know that Louis XV will eventually succeed him, but it's quite worrying at the time that he doesn't know how much, if anyone will survive at all, it seems. Yes, he's, the succession is a worry. He only has one son, and he leaves the succession disputed. Because there could have been a claim by the Spanish Bourbons against the Orléans Bourbons. And he even puts his illegitimate sons into the legitimate order of succession, which no other monarch had done until a very long time previously. So he's playing about with the succession in quite an unwise way. He leaves France. It, there could have been a civil war if his illegitimate son, the Duc du Maine, had been more ruthless and more ambitious, which he was not. And there, could, there was a war between the Philip V of Spain and his cousin, the Duke d'Orléans. And, but in fact, Louis XV survives, and he only survives because his governess, the Duchesse de Ventadour, removes him from the care of the royal doctors, who were going to give him terrible treatments, which might have killed him. And she was much more practical. And indeed, even Louis XIV, his own doctor, Dr. Fagon, was not as good as the Paris doctors. So there's many practical decisions which he took, which were mistakes. Hmm. And I want to talk about, you mentioned his legitimate son, of course, and I want to bring up, if you, I don't know, we don't have much time left, but I want to talk about one of his lo- most famous lovers as well, which is called Madame de Montespan. So let's talk a little bit about his mistresses as well during his reign well he loved women in fact during his reign a book was published in paris called of the equality of two sexes and the necessity of getting rid of prejudices and women at versailles had a much better time than at other european courts and he had many mistresses probably more than we know but his chief mistress in the 1670s was Madame de Montespan, 
born of Rochechouart from one of the grandest French noble families. And she was a great patron of the arts. She dressed very well. She animated court parties, but she had a bad temper. She was overweight. She had many children and the king began to lose interest in her in 1678. And in the end, she was she left the court about seven years later. But we never hear her side of the story. Her letters have not been found or published. It'd be very interesting to hear what she really thought. She was also involved in the affair of the poisons, which also helped destroy her reputation uh, when women were using uh, drugs to maybe get rid of lovers or husbands. And she was replaced by another highly intelligent and interesting and powerful woman from a very humble background, the widow of a disreputable poet called Madame Scarron. She becomes governess of the king's illegitimate son, and then the king makes her Marquise de Maintenon. And gradually and cleverly, by a very good temper and excellent conversation and just brain power, she becomes the king's beloved confidant and almost certainly from 1683 or four, his second wife married secretly. In his apartments, she's treated as a queen. Outside them in public, she's treated as a lady in waiting. It's a very unusual situation, but the king sees her every day. He often can sees his ministers in her apartment. She has a very good apartment in Versailles and she has huge influence. Her letters are fascinating to other women, to her relations. She's completely, everybody's writing to her asking for jobs and she also gets news. She knows if there's been a bread riot in a provincial market in Normandy. And she's used to tell King the king un disagreeable truths. So, of course, an another thing I want to ask about Versailles before we move on to the Spanish succession is there is, of course, well, I think you well known that there were, were no bathrooms, so to speak, in the modern sense, like the think of in Versailles. I hope, can only hope they have been installed later. But is it how to, did people really take shits and piss everywhere in the stench must have been horrendous in Versailles? Is, how true is this that the, there were like people taking shits and taking pissing everywhere in Versailles? There were lavatories in people's apartments, or they, they would obviously have. Um, what do you call them? Uh, chamber, chamber pots. And on the staircases of Versailles, sometimes members of the public would piss. You couldn't, because it was so public, you couldn't really stop that. It was more difficult. But no, it's, I think it's exaggerated about the stench. Louis XIV himself was quite clean. Uh, the ladies were very clean. It, ha it had pretty high standards of food and behavior compared to other public places in Europe. And of course, the next- I've never read a- Pardon? Pardon? Yes, go ahead. I've never read uh, accounts uh, by foreigners complain complaining of the smell under Louis XIV. And one of the things, of course, that is perhaps the biggest event in Louis XIV's reign, you mentioned his grandson, Philip V, who of course become the Spanish Bourbon. And uh, let's let's talk about how did this war, and this is an episode in itself, of course, and maybe on the whole podcast. But let so let's discuss the war of the Spanish succession, which I'm sure might be for some listeners the highlight of Blue Protein Train and to read about. So let's talk discuss how did the war of Spanish succession come because it almost loses the war and the Bourbons are almost on the throne in Spain. So let's so let's discuss the consequences and of course the war of Spanish succession. Well, Philip V in 1700 is very well received in Spain. He's popular. He's quite good looking. He's certainly healthier than the Spanish Habsburgs. And he has the best hereditary claim. But there is a war partly provoked by Louis XIV recognizing James II's son as King of England against his treaty with William III. And 
partly by over-management and over-control, uh, the French military position collapses after about 1708. Anyway, French soldiers were unhealthier than Dutch or English soldiers. The, the population was not in a good condition. In addition, there were famines, bad harvests, uh, terrible weather, freezing weather from the winter. So parts of France were economically devastated. The king is desperate for peace after 1709. Madame de Maintenon, in particular, wants peace because she's always pessimistic. He's even wants Philip V to leave the throne of Spain to put the Austrian candidate on the throne. But in the end, three factors help him. Firstly, there are political divisions in England and a pro-peace government comes to power, the Tories. Secondly, the French army recovers under the Maréchal de Villars, and Louis XIV's forts are quite good. And thirdly, the Spanish, like Philip V, his armies win battles, helped by the French army, helped by the personal courage of Philip V, who's much braver than Louis XIV himself. And so, in fact, the Allies do not win the War of the Spanish Succession. Louis XIV half wins it, and above all, he keeps his grandson, King of Spain, which will diplomatically be helpful for France later in the 18th century. Together, France and Spain defeat Britain in the War of the American Independence and help create the United States of America. The United States owes its existence in part to two Bourbon kings, descendants of Louis XIV. But it was a very uh -huh. close run thing. But the glory for the Bourbons of having two kings of France and Spain was immense. Another thing I want to point out as well, and as I believe that there is some point that he's about to do, so Louis XIV actually do for one time, he put the country before his dynasty. So that's, so it's at some point, I believe he does realize that he may have to go and it, though it may pain him, he actually does put his own country ahead of his own dynasty. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. What is the so, question? Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry. Uh, Louis XIV does at some point put his own country ahead of his own dynasty when he almost loses oh. the Spanish succession. And yes, he, yes, he does. He does think it would be better for France to make peace in 1709 and 1710. But he's, but um, and he's very aware of French needs. But he doesn't really expand in the Spanish Netherlands as much as he could have, and he has to yield. Um, Tournai and Mons and other very decisive places. But he does keep Alsace, French Flanders and Franche Comté, which are huge additions for France. He makes Strasbourg French. So let's talk about it was the death. Of, and there is a, I do believe there is a French film I would really would like to see about the death of Louis XIV. But let's talk about the death of Louis XIV and his final days as a monarch. Yeah. It's very interesting, his, his account, the accounts of his death. You see the fully function, how the French monarchy functioned. He's not particularly popular, but yet the courtyards of Versailles are full of members of the public who want news. The first floor of the palace is packed with statesmen, ambassadors, administrators, nobles, courtiers. And the king criticizes himself in his last message to his great grandson. He says he's liked wars and buildings too much, and he should have done more for the ordinary people. So there is built in self criticism in the French monarchy. And when he dies, France doesn't collapse, the finances don't collapse. His nephew is the very clever and able regent, Duke d'Orléans, who re restores the situation, keeps 
the peace on the whole. The Duke du Men and Philip V, his rivals, don't really threaten his authority. F the French economy begins to bounce back because it's naturally so strong with the navy, the colonies, uh, its own products, its luxuries, and so on. That's when Bordeaux is built. But the interesting thing is when the king's very grand, long funeral procession leaves Versailles to go to Saint-Denis, the burial place of the kings of France, all along the route, and there are several accounts of this, there are little pop-up restaurants and cabarets where people are laughing and dancing and singing and playing music because they're so relieved the king is dead, finally. And the thing they complain about more almost than the wars are the high levels of taxation he had imposed. So France is really quite restless by the time of his death. How would you compare, because as stated, I would leave just a sec, I don't, a second. I don't remember the author's name, but it, one of the biographers of uh, Louis XVI claims that his father, Louis XV, or grandfather, sorry, not father, but grandfather, chose to rule by fear instead of love, being loved by the people. So, But how would you compare that the reign of that of Louis XV versus that of Louis XIV? I think Louis XIV might... was, much, was much tougher, a more real figure to whom people could rally. I mean, the way he goes, every campaign, he's with his troops. I mean, not very near the front, but he's with the army. He's a practicing military monarch, which a lot of French public opinion liked. He's more original. He's a better patron of the arts. He's more active. He speaks to people. Louis XV was very silent. He didn't say much. And above all, he's defeated by Britain in the Seven Years' War, which Louis XIV wasn't. And he didn't exploit his victories in previous wars when he could have got more territory for France. Again, he puts his son-in-law as Duke of Parma instead of increasing French territory in the southern Netherlands. I think Louis XIV was better at keeping authority than Louis XV, who leaves the French throne deeply challenged by the law courts, the nobles, writers, and the people of Paris. Um, I want to end the episode before we go by discussing a little bit of the legacy of Versailles. We spoke about that the Olympics yeah. are being held there this year, but in general, throughout history, after Louis XIV until the present. Now, let's discuss the legacy and hit aftermath of yes. Versailles. Well, Versailles goes on being the, the capital of France with Paris until 1789. Foreigners go on, more and more foreigners come to visit it. There are other palaces are built in Europe, which partly imitate it in Spain and in Germany. Everybody wants to have a French music, French dances, French food, French theatres, French operas. And that's partly due to Versailles, though also to Paris. And interestingly, in the 19th century, both Louis XVIII and Napoleon consider living in Versailles. Louis Philippe makes it a museum, but also lives in the Grand Trianon, Louis XIV's personal creation, which he designed himself in the park of Versailles. People keep going back to Versailles as a reference for splendor, elegance, beauty, fashion. It, many visitors, Napoleon III gives a ball there for Queen Victoria. And now there are so many films, so many companies launching products there. And this summer, 2024, there will be part of the Summer Olympics, horse events and pentathlon and shooting events in the park of Versailles, which is completely appropriate because Louis XIV was a great athlete as a young man. He loved riding and hunting and horses. He had pictures of his horses. And Versailles in his reign, it's not just a royal palace, it's a global hub for activities, for dancing and music and riding and hunting. 
you, to understand Versailles, you have to think of the music coming from the windows, the sound of hunting, the horses everywhere in the park and the avenues around the palace. And Louis XIV wanted global attention, and that is what Versailles will be having this summer. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I think we're going to round it up there. It's been a pleasure to talk with you, of course. We only discussed the tip of the iceberg on Louis XIV. So if you want to learn more, you should absolutely read his book on Louis XIV, King of the World. And of course, it's quite thick. So we, like you said, we only discussed minimal of Louis' reign. So you should absolutely look up more. And you sent me a video that I will share in the description that you should okay. check out on Louis XIV. And of course, before you go, do you have any social media you want to share? Or where can people buy your books or... And the website you want to share in the description of this episode if you people want to find out more about the report. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Goodbye. This has been Well Age Well. Man, we can find us on social media under X slash Twitter um under Well Age Well on Instagram well under Well Age Well. If you yeah. if you are on Spotify, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcast. YouTube, wherever you can find this podcast these days. And of course, you remember to write rate five stars if you like this episode and check out some other episodes that we have. You definitely want to find something that you like. If you are an Apple podcast, consider writing a review. That will help us out a lot. And if I find it, I will try to read it on in the beginning of this episode. It will really appreciate every review that I can get. This has been uh, my name is Alan. This has been with that age well. Please like, share, and subscribe. I'll see you next time.